Thank you so much, Natalie, for coming and presenting on this very exciting topic, Public Charities Can Lobby, How Your 501c3 Can Influence Policy for the Greater Good. We're so excited to have you here at Spokes Hub, and uh, please take it away. I'm so glad to be here. Um, as was just mentioned, we're going to talk today a little bit about the rules that apply to public charities, specifically when they want to engage in lobbying activities. Uh, so we'll talk about how lobbying is defined for public charities. We'll talk about how you can measure your public charities lobbying limits. All of this is really helpful because um, different types of tax exempt organizations have different rules that apply to them. And one of the things that you'll find out about public charities in particular is that they're limited in how much lobbying activity they can do. And so today's discussion is really gonna focus in on that limitation and to help you figure out and navigate how much lobbying your public charity can do, or um, if you happen to be fiscally sponsored, how your fiscal sponsor might be thinking about lobbying activities uh, so that you can do as much as possible within the confines of what your tax exempt status allows. Um, so we're going to be chatting about this topic for about 45 minutes or so. Drop your questions in the chat if you happen to have any, but then at the end, we'll again um, have some time for Q&A at the end where people can come off mute and have a discussion. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, just wanted to to kind of start by setting the stage in terms of the conversation, um, but a little bit more about Alliance for Justice, which is the nonprofit that I work for. We are an association of 130, a little bit more than 130 organizations that share a commitment to an equitable, just, and free society. Um, and we really try to strengthen the progressive movement by training and educating nonprofits on advocacy and harnessing their collective power to transform our state and federal courts. Um, so we are a membership organization, but we have a couple of really key programs. And so if you're interested in learning more about the federal judiciary or the state court system and who sits on those benches, um, we have a wealth of information on our website, afj.org. Uh, but then we also have our Boulder Advocacy Program, which you'll find information about on that same website, um, which is designed to equip nonprofits with the knowledge and tools that they need to engage in bold and effective advocacy. Um, and so we really pride ourselves on strengthening the power of grassroots groups um, and helping them navigate what these rules are because sometimes the rules might seem like more of a prohibition than they actually are. And so our goal really is to allow groups to do as much as possible within the confines of what their tax exempt status allows. Um, now, I think this was mentioned during the introduction earlier, but I'm a lawyer. Um, unfortunately, though, I am not your lawyer, so I can't offer any legal advice during today's presentation. Uh, but again, I am definitely happy to help you navigate these basic rules and to answer any questions that come up along the way. Um, so with that, we're going to start with just a little bit of an agenda so that you can see where this conversation is going to go. We're going to start with an overview of what advocacy is and what lobbying is, because lobbying is a very particular type of advocacy. We'll then talk about different types of tax-exempt organizations and the basic rules and characteristics that apply to each. And so we'll talk about, for example, the difference between a 501c3 public charity and a 501c4 social welfare organization. We'll then kind of shift gears a little bit. We'll talk about public charity lobbying limits. And so as a public charity or a representative of a public charity, how can you measure your organization's lobbying limits according to that tax code again? We'll then talk about the definitions for lobbying so that you can determine which of your activities might qualify and need to be tracked against those lobbying limits. And then finally, we'll have some key takeaways and resources um, that you can use when navigating uh, the lobbying rules um, and when trying to stay within the rules that apply to your organization's uh, nonprofit status. Um, and so just to kind of get us started, we're going to talk about advocacy and lobbying. But again, lobbying is a very particular type of advocacy, and we're going to dive in depth into the definitions of lobbying here in a few minutes. But for you know, kind of starting purposes, what we have to think about in terms of advocacy is that advocacy is an activity that supports a cause or a proposal. It's a tool that is used by nonprofit organizations, by individuals, by corporations to advance their missions. Um, and advocacy, the general idea is speaking out on behalf of a cause, um, speaking out on behalf of others, really using your voice to advance policy, but also um, to advocate on behalf of others. That might be individuals within your community. 
Lobbying, on the other hand, is a very particular type of advocacy. And so when we think about lobbying, the tax code tells us that lobbying is effectively a legislative activity. And so if you want to, for example, try to support a bill that's pending before your state legislature, or maybe you want to defend against bad legislation that's being considered at the city, state, federal level, that is when you're potentially triggering a lobbying activity. Because lobbying, again, is a very particular type of advocacy that is designed to influence specific legislation. And so when we look at the basic rules that apply to different types of tax-exempt organizations, this is where you'll see some distinctions in terms of what different types of organizations are allowed to do in regards to lobbying, but also in regards to election-related activities. Um, and so on this particular chart, we have a few different columns here, right? We have a column on the left for 501c3 public charities. Many of you in this room probably work for public charities or volunteer for public charities. Um, they are kind of the most typical thing when you think of a nonprofit organization. Generally, you're thinking about 501c3s and public charities. These are organizations like Alliance for Justice, which is the organization that I work for. They are very unique types of organizations because not only are they tax exempt, meaning they don't pay an income tax on the funds that they bring in, but they also receive tax deductible contributions. And so if a donor wants to contribute to a 501c3 public charity, they not only get to feel good about the mission that they're supporting, right, because they're probably giving a donation to an organization whose mission aligns with their values, but they also get a tax deduction. So when it comes time to file um, their personal tax return at the end of the tax year, they get that tax deduction for that donation to a 501c3 public charity. And so again, public charities are tax exempt, so they don't pay an income tax on the funds that they raise, but they also receive tax deductible contributions. This means that they are extremely unique types of organizations. They have one of the most favorable treatments in the tax code, but in exchange for that incredibly favorable tax treatment, there are going to be some strings attached to the dollars that they bring in and how they're allowed to spend that money. Um, and so what you'll find out is that 501c3 public charities are allowed to lobby. They're allowed to engage in legislative activities, but they're limited in how much of that type of activity they can do. And so we'll talk about, again, how to measure those limits here in a few minutes. The one major prohibition on 501c3 advocacy is that they are not allowed to support or oppose candidates for public office, which means that everything that a C3 does has to be nonpartisan. Um, now that's different, and you'll see this in the second column, than the rules that apply to 501c4 social welfare organizations, like Alliance for Justice Action, which is Alliance for Justice's affiliated 501c4 organization. Um, we could also, in that center column, put unions and trade associations. So 501c5s and 501c6s are going to have the same characteristics as 501c4 social welfare organizations. These are tax-exempt organizations as well, so they're not paying an income tax on the funds that they bring in, but they don't receive tax-deductible contributions. And so if a donor gives to a C4 or a C5 or a C6, they can feel good about the mission that they're supporting and the organization that they're supporting, but they don't get the benefit of that personal tax deduction. Um, but because the tax treatment for C4, C5s, and C6s isn't quite as favorable, they can actually do an unlimited amount of lobbying activities and they are allowed to support or oppose candidates for public office, so long as that's a secondary activity of the organization and not the primary activity. And then we go further down the tax exempt spectrum um, and we have things like 527s, which are political organizations also known as PACs. So groups like EMILY's list, they are tax exempt too, but again, they don't receive those tax deductible contributions. They exist almost entirely to support or oppose candidates for public office. And so they are responsible for all those ads that you're seeing run right now in the lead up to November. Um, but again, different types of tax exempt organizations have different characteristics, but in addition to those different characteristics, they also have different rules that apply to their advocacy. And so we're gonna focus in on those rules for 501c3 public charities today. Um, and general takeaway is that they are allowed to lobby as long as they stay within some lobbying limits, but they are not allowed to support or oppose candidates for public office. Um, now, just to put that another way, we have kind of our red light, green light analogy slide here. Um, 
501c3 public charities allowed to do a lot of different types of advocacy. The red light, though, the stop, don't go there, don't risk or don't jeopardize your tax exempt status is partisan political activity. And so, again, everything a C3 does has to be nonpartisan. Um, so you need to stop short of supporting or opposing candidates for public office as a C3, or you could uh, potentially expose yourself to a tax, um, or you could, you know, in extreme situations, potentially lose your tax exempt status. And again, um, that's why this becomes a red light type of activity for C3s. Lobbying, though, is your legislative work, and that's your yellow light, because again, you are allowed to lobby as long as you clear the intersection. So as long as you stay within your lobbying limits um, and make sure that you're tracking those lobbying activities appropriately. And then every other type of advocacy gets the green light for 501c3 public charities. So whether that's engaging in research, um, hosting trainings, engaging in litigation, nonpartisan voter education, hosting an educational conference, everything again that you see in green on this particular screen is the type of advocacy activity that you could do an unlimited amount of as a 501c3 public charity. And so a lot of flexibility for 501c3 public charities to engage in many different types of advocacy. It's just that they have to stop short of supporting or opposing candidates for public office. Um, and if they engage in any lobbying, have to remain within their lobbying limits. Um, and so with that in mind, we're gonna talk a little bit about how public charities can measure their lobbying limits. So how do we know when our lobbying is too much? <laughs> how do we know how to stay within our limits and you know, make sure that we're following those rules that are set forth in the tax code? Um, well, what we know is that when we become a 501c3 public charity, we're generally gonna get a determination letter from the IRS. They're gonna say, congratulations, you're a public charity. Um, if you happen to have a C3 fiscal sponsor, it's likely that they're a public charity. And so these limits would apply to them as well. Um, but that default test, as soon as your 501c3 public charity is born, so on the day that it gets that recognition of charity status from the IRS, the default test is called the insubstantial part test. And what it says is that you are allowed to lobby as long as it's an insubstantial part of your organization's overall activities. Um, now, unfortunately, the tax code doesn't provide a ton of guidance in terms of what qualifies as an insubstantial amount of lobbying. Um, but looking at a bunch of uh, different um, expert opinions and some guidance from the IRS, we think it's around three to 5% of your overall activities that can be put towards lobbying under that default insubstantial part test. Um, what's important to note here is that that is an activities-based test. And so if you have an organization that is run by volunteers, for example, even if they aren't paid, even if there are no dollars leaving your organization, if you are operating under that insubstantial part test, all lobbying activities need to count against that three to 5% of lobbying activities limit. Um, and so, you know, again, if you're under this default test, around three to 5% of your overall activities can be lobbying activities, which are legislative activities. Um, but that does include both paid and unpaid time. And so volunteer hours, um, if you have board members who aren't paid and they're out lobbying on behalf of the organization, all of that needs to count against your limits as a 501c3 public charity if you're operating under that insubstantial part test. Um, now, there is an option that the vast majority of public charities are allowed to use a different test if they decide to opt into that different test. It's called the 501h expenditure test. Um, and what this does is if a public charity opts into using the 501H expenditure test as opposed to that default insubstantial part test, then they not only get clearer definitions for what qualifies as lobbying, but they actually get a mathematical formula where they can plug in their organization's annual budget effectively and calculate exactly how much they are allowed to spend on lobbying each year. And depending on the size of the organization, that can be up to 20% of the budget that could be put towards lobbying activities if an organization makes that 501H election. Um, now, that's obviously a lot more substantial than the 3 to 5% of overall activities that is the limit under that default insubstantial part test. And that's why many organizations will make this 501H election to maximize their lobbying limits and to take advantage of those much more clear definitions of lobbying that kick in when you make that 501H election. Um, the other really cool thing about this test is that it is a dollar-based test, not an activities-based test. 
And so once you've calculated your lobbying limit for the year, you know exactly how many dollars you can spend on lobbying under this test, um, then you also don't have to count anything that doesn't cost you money against that limit. And so if you take 100 volunteers to the Capitol to lobby against a bad bill that's being considered by your state legislature, you might have to count the cost of the bus that you run in to get people there as a lobbying expense. Uh, but all that volunteer time wouldn't count against your limit because they're not getting paid to be there. Um, so again, this is a dollar-based test, this 501H expenditure test. Um, it's a much more generous lobbying limit for the vast majority of organizations. And that's why a number of public charities will make the 501H election to do their work because they can do much more lobbying under that test. Um, now, I will mention that um, that under this particular test, churches, religious congregations, um, there's a you know kind of a limited narrow scope of organizations of C3s that are not allowed to make the 501H election, uh, but the vast majority of public charities are. Um, I think I saw a hand come up. Yeah. I just had a follow-up question to this one. Um, yeah. I'm really curious about the 501H expenditure test when it comes to travel reimbursement for volunteers. Does travel reimbursement count as paid volunteerism time? So under that particular test, um, yes, you would count those as direct costs. Um, so if you make that 501H election, you're going to be tracking staff time. So if you have any paid staff and they do lobbying, whatever the value of that time they spent lobbying would count against your lobbying limits. Um, also direct costs. So the cost of the bus to get the volunteers there. If you reimburse them mileage or for a plane ticket, those direct costs that are associated with lobbying would count as lobbying expenditures as well. And then also a percentage of overhead um, would count against your lobbying limit um, too. And so, yes, those are the types of things that count. Um, but I do see kind of in the chat, there's another question about calculating unpaid volunteer time. I will say that is one of the frustrations about the insubstantial part test is, you know, what is the value of a volunteer hour? Um, different accountants have different methods for calculating that, just have a reasonable and consistent system. Uh, but, you know, there should be a way that you can... Um, make a reasonable estimate as to what the value of that time would be. Um, and then on your 990 at the end of the year, you would have to report those volunteer hours and the cost of any lobbying that you did um, under that insubstantial part test. But yeah, I think I think something like a travel reimbursement under that 501H expenditure test would definitely um, count as well. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the general overview of lobbying limits, how you know how much your 501c3 public charity can do. I mentioned that if you make that 501H election, you get an actual mathematical formula um, so that you can calculate your lobbying limits. This is what that formula looks like. And you can tell that the formula varies just a little bit um, based on the organization's annual exempt purpose expenditures. And so if you're a, you know, a smaller organization of $500,000 or less, and you make that 501H election, well, now all of a sudden you can spend 20% of your budget on lobbying, which again, much more substantial than that three to 5% under the insubstantial part test. Um, now, once you calculate your overall lobbying limit for the year, your grassroots lobbying is capped at 25% of that total. Um, and so if you want to spend your entire lobbying budget on what's called direct lobbying, and we're going to we're gonna define this in a minute, so don't worry about that. Um, but if you want to spend all of your lobbying budget on direct lobbying, you can. But if you do any grassroots lobbying, that can only be 25% of your overall lobbying budget for the year. Um, and so just to give you a little bit more of an example of what that looks like, um, let's say, again, that you have a $500,000 annual exempt purpose expenditure organization. You decide you want to opt in to making that 501H election, which super easy to do. By the way, you file IRS form 5768, which is the easiest IRS form you will ever see. I mean, if you know the name of the organization and its address, you are, you're pretty much done with that form. Um, but once you file that, you calculate your lobbying limit. So if you're in that 500,000 or less range, 20% of your budget can be put towards lobbying, which means you have an overall lobbying limit of $100,000. 25,000 of which can be spent on grassroots lobbying. So if you want to do 75,000 on direct lobbying, 25,000 on grassroots, you can. Or if you want to spend the whole thing on direct lobbying, you can do that too. But if you do any grassroots lobbying, it's capped at 25% of your total lobbying budget for the year under that 501H election. Um, now, to make this easy, we do have a calculator online. 
Um, and so if you want to scan that QR code, it'll pop you over to our lobbying calculator. You can type in, you know, you don't need to have to have the exact number, but type in your estimated budget for the year. And that'll give you an idea of what you would be able to spend on both direct and grassroots lobbying if your organization chose to make that 501H election. Um, now, I will also mention that um, you know, if you are a fiscally sponsored organization of a 501c3 public charity, um, then your fiscal sponsor is also subject to these lobbying limits. And so depending on whether your fiscal sponsor uses that insubstantial part test or that 501h expenditure test, they may want you to report back differently your lobbying expenditures, your lobbying activities, because they have to report that on their 990 when it's time to uh, do their return at the end of the tax year. Um, and so again, you know, whether you're in a fiscal sponsor relationship or you are a standalone 501c3 public charity, you need to be aware of these lobbying definitions and limits because chances are you're going to need to report those to the IRS on your 990. Um, and again, you want to make sure that you're tracking those to make sure that you're staying within your lobbying limits as well. Uh, but that calculator should be helpful if anyone's curious just to see what they might be able to spend on lobbying if they made that 501h election. Um, now, just a few things to kind of put this into context. Um, you know, one thing you want to do if you do engage in any lobbying activities, you got to track that lobbying. Um, the IRS, again, allows public charities to lobby as long as they stay within their lobbying limits, which is why they require you to report your lobbying on Form 990 when you file that at the end of the tax year, or why your fiscal sponsor has to report your lobbying on their 990 at the end of the tax year. Um, you also want to make sure you're using funds that don't restrict lobbying. There are some grants that are really particular in terms of whether they'll allow you to use the funds for lobbying. And so make sure you respect the contractual agreements that you've entered into with your funders. Um, but again, these are things you can do. Lobbying, generally speaking, allowable activity for public charities as long as you're tracking it and you're staying within your lobbying limits and reporting it appropriately um, to the IRS when you need to do so. Um, but again, fiscally sponsored organizations are going to be subject to their fiscal sponsors lobbying limits, um, which is why if you happen to fall into that category of organization, you do want to track um, and talk with your funders about how to track and report your lobbying. And they may have some other ideas in terms of of what they think your limits should be because they're going to ultimately have to total up the lobbying of all of their fiscally sponsored groups and make sure that's within their lobbying limit as an entire organization. And so a little bit more bookkeeping on their on their part um, to make sure that they remain in compliance. Um, but that's why you want to have a conversation with them just so that you are tracking and reporting to them appropriately. Uh, but again, remember, not all advocacy counts as lobbying. Um, only lobbying needs to be counted against your organization's lobbying limits. And so, you know, if, for example, you have a, a donor collaborative working on a report about the impact of the Open Society Foundation's funding withdrawal on the sex worker rights movement, you know, these types of reports and analysis, this data collection and, um, and review probably not going to count as lobbying activities. We'll again talk a little bit more about those definitions here in a few. So those types of things don't need to count against your lobbying limits. It's only things that meet the definition of lobbying that need to be tracked and reported against your organization's lobbying limits. Um, and so now we know how much lobbying we are allowed to do as public charities, uh, but we also need to know what lobbying is, right? So how can we tell when our activity becomes something more than just a basic advocacy activity and actually comes into that lobbying space. Um, and the trick here is that the definition of lobbying is going to vary depending on whether your organization uses that default insubstantial part test or you've made the 501H election. Um, so if you are operating under that default insubstantial part test, and in other words, your public charity has not opted in to using the 501H election or your fiscal sponsor has not opted in to using the 501H election, um, then these are your definitions of lobbying. Communication to lawmakers to influence legislation, encouraging the public to contact their lawmakers to influence legislation, or anything that advocates for or against legislation at any level of government. Um, so if you happen to be advocating for or against a proposed ordinance, in front of city council. That would count as a lobbying activity and need to be tracked against your lobbying limits as an insubstantial part test filer. Um, if you happen to be encouraging the public to contact their legislator about a bill that's pending before uh, the Senate, 
that would be considered a lobbying activity that needs to be counted against your lobbying limits. Um, under these definitions, things like ballot measure advocacy, because ballot measures become law if the public votes to approve them. So supporting or opposing ballot measures would be lobbying that needs to be tracked against your lobbying limits. Um, trying to suggest what should or should not be included in the local, state, or federal budget would be considered lobbying. Why? Because the budget is voted on by a legislative body. It has to be approved. Um, and so trying to influence what does or does not get included in the budget would also be considered a lobbying activity. Um, similarly, if you have a nomination that requires legislative confirmation, if you do any advocacy around that nomination, that counts as lobbying too. Um, so think, for example, about things like the Supreme Court, right? If there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, the president who's an executive branch official, he gets to nominate someone for that vacant position, but then the Senate has to vote to confirm that position or, or to confirm that person or to reject them. So any nominations that require Senate confirmation or legislative confirmation, advocacy around that counts as lobbying. But the long story short again here is that if you are under that insubstantial part test, anything that advocates for or against legislation counts as lobbying needs to be tracked against those lobbying limits, regardless of whether it costs you any money, because again, that's an activities-based test, not a dollar-based test. Um, and then under that test, around three to 5% of your overall activities can be put towards lobbying. Um, now, what you're gonna notice though, is those different, or those definitions of lobbying are different than the definitions that apply to organizations that have made that 501H election to maximize their lobbying limits. Um, and so if your organization decides to make the 501H election, or maybe it's already done so, or maybe your fiscal sponsor has already done so, then these are your definitions for lobbying. So they're going to be a little bit more narrow than the definitions under that insubstantial part test. Um, so what is lobbying under 501H? Well, there's two types. There's direct lobbying and there's grassroots lobbying. Direct lobbying is communication with a legislator that expresses a view about specific legislation. And grassroots lobbying is communication with the general public that expresses a view about specific legislation and contains a call to action. Now, again, if you're under that 501H expenditure test and you've opted into that, if you are going to have to count something against your lobbying limits, it has to meet each of the elements of one of these two definitions for lobbying. Um, again, your grassroots lobbying is capped at 25% of your overall lobbying budget for the year under this test, but you could spend everything on direct lobbying if you wanted to. Uh, but again, if any element from either one of these definitions is missing, you would not be engaged in a lobbying communication. Um, and so just to kind of walk through these definitions a little bit, make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, when we're talking about a communication, we're really talking about any type of communication. So whether it's putting a, you know, a letter in the mail to someone, that's a communication. Having a one-on-one -on -one in-person meeting with them, that's a communication. A phone call, um, an email, a social media post is a type of communication. Communication is pretty broadly defined. It's probably everything you think it is and more. Uh, a lot of groups are getting really creative with their communications. They're projecting words and images on the sides of government buildings. Um, you know, that's not the most traditional form of communication, but it's certainly a communication. Um, likewise, uh, we've worked with some groups that decided to send some giant cakes to legislators with vote no on SB something on the front of the cake. Um, that's a communication. It's a very delicious type of communication, uh, but that's a communication as well. Um, but again, for something to be direct or grassroots lobbying, there has to be a communication. Um, more specifically, though, if something is going to be considered direct lobbying, it has to be a communication to a legislator. Um, and so the next question becomes, who is a legislator? Um, and the answer is, is that it's legislative officials at any level of government. So that could be, for example, your city council members. Those are local level legislators or your county commissioners or county board of supervisors. Those might be county level legislators. Um, it includes your state legislature. So the member of your state house of representatives and the members of your state Senate would consider legislators as well. Members of Congress. So, you know, your senator, your house of representatives, those are considered legislators. Staff are also included. So legislative staff, you know, if you call up a senator and you don't get her chief of, or you don't get her on the, on the phone, but you get her chief of staff, that's considered an extension of the legislator. So that counts as communication with the legislator too. Uh, but again, we're talking about legislative officials at any level of government and their staff. Um, and so if you are you know, thinking, am I engaged in direct lobbying? You've got to, again, have a communication. It has to be to a legislator. And then you have to ask yourself, 
does it express a view about specific legislation? Uh, but again, legislators at any level of government. So the IRS really wants to monitor your lobbying and make sure you're staying within your lobbying limits um, for all of your lobbying activities, not just federal lobbying, but also local level, state level lobbying. If you happen to work internationally, um, if you work with international legislative bodies, that could be triggered there too. Uh, but you've got to count all your lobbying up, track it against your limits, regardless of what level of government. Um, now, normally, I will say members of the executive branch are not considered legislators. Um, and so 99.9% .9 of the time, if you call up your governor's office and you want to talk to the governor about a policy that you're thinking about, it's not going to count as lobbying because you are not engaging with a legislative official. You are engaging with an executive branch official. Um, and so under these tax code definitions and lobbying limits, that would not be considered a lobbying communication unless you are asking that executive branch official to step into the legislative process to help with the formulation of legislation. Um, so let's say, for example, that the U.S. Congress passes a bill. Your organization thinks that it's a really bad bill. It's going to have a negative impact on the communities that you serve as a nonprofit. You could call up the president's office and ask him to veto that bill, veto that piece of legislation so that it does not become law. Well, at that point in time, you are asking President Biden to step into the legislative process. And so, you know, whereas, you know, talking to him any other day of the week, you're probably not engaged in a lobbying communication. If you ask him to intervene in that legislative process by signing a bill, by killing a bill, by chiming in in terms of um, what content should or should not be included in a bill, those limited interactions with executive branch officials can count as lobbying as well. Um, but if you happen to be calling him to take a position on an executive order, which is something that can be done by the executive unilaterally, doesn't need legislative approval, um, that's not going to count as lobbying. It's only when you're asking them to intervene in that legislative process. Um, so again, most of the time, your governor, your president, your mayor, not going to be considered legislators. And so communications with them don't need to be tracked against your organization's lobbying limits. However, if you're asking them to participate in that legislative process, to intervene in that legislative process or to formulate legislation, you would want to count that. Um, but I do see there's another question. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, if if an organization were um, advocating for a stay of execution to a governor, where would that land? So that's a clemency action. Um, and uh, that would be an executive branch activity that does not need to track against a lobbying limit because the governor can make that decision unilaterally. They don't need a legislative approval to grant clemency. Um, same thing with pardons. You know, if you wanted to get a pardon for a crime, that would that would count as executive branch action, too. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, who a legislator is and then who a legislator isn't. <laughs> um, I will also say that there is a unique situation where the public becomes a legislator. We kind of teased this out earlier. Um, and that's when the public is voting on a ballot measure. So whether it's a ballot initiative a bond measure, different states, different localities, call them different things, maybe a constitutional amendment, but any proposition that the public gets to vote on. Um, so in other words, I go to the, the ballot box in November, I get to vote on a lot of different candidates, but then I also get to vote on different measures that might be considered. Those measures are legislation because if the public approves them, they become law, but if the public rejects them, they don't become law. So they are considered to be pieces of specific legislation. And so in the ballot measure context, the public is a legislative body. Um, and so if you happen to do any advocacy around ballot measures, supporting or opposing a ballot measure, um, just be aware that that does need to be tracked against your lobbying limits under either test. But if you happen to be under that 501H test, it's going to count specifically as direct lobbying, which is a good thing because direct lobbying isn't capped like grassroots lobbying. You can count that uh, ballot measure advocacy against your direct lobbying limit as opposed to your grassroots lobbying limit. Um, now, ballot measure advocacy does oftentimes trigger local and state uh, campaign finance and reporting requirements just because it happens in an election context. So just be aware that those laws exist as well. Uh, but in terms of tracking that activity against your lobbying limits, it is a direct lobbying activity as opposed to a grassroots lobbying activity. Um, now, there are other types of entities, too. Um, and you'll see them in that right hand column that do not count as legislators. These are special purpose bodies. So things like school boards, um, planning commissions, housing authorities, 
A lot of times they might set some sort of policy, they might implement the law, but they don't have their own legislative authority. And so if, for example, you wanted to do some advocacy before a school board, try to impact district school district policy, that does not have to be tracked against your lobbying limits as well, because again, those are considered to be special purpose bodies as opposed to legislative bodies. Um, and so a lot of different things to consider here. But again, when we talk about legislators, we're talking about legislators and lawmakers at every level of government, whether that's federal, state, county, uh, town, local, it would incl include things like tribal councils um, and international legislative bodies as well. Um, generally not speaking about executive branch officials like the president, governor, mayor, unless you're asking them to intervene in the formulation of legislation or that legislative process. Uh, but we are, when we talk about legislators, talking about the public as well in that ballot measure context in particular. Um, now, again, for something to be considered lobbying, it can't just be a communication. It can't just be a communication to a legislator. I can talk to a legislator all day, every day. And that doesn't mean I'm lobbying under these tax code definitions unless I express a view about specific legislation during that conversation. Um, and so just to kind of put a finer point on this, what is specific legislation? It's the budget. It's bills and acts that are being considered by the Senate, by the House of Representatives, maybe a proposed ordinance being considered by city council. Nominations that require legislative confirmation, ballot measures are going to be considered specific legislation. Asking someone to sponsor a bill, asking them not to sponsor a bill, that's considered uh, expressing a view on specific legislation. Um, and then concrete policy proposals. So if you, you know, make a policy proposal that could only be achieved through legislative action, that's considered expressing a view on specific legislation too. Uh, but what is not specific legislation? Regulations executive orders, enforcement of existing law, litigation. Um, so again, these are non-legislative in nature. And so if you want to call up the governor's office or the president's office, ask them to sign an executive order about an issue that you care about, that doesn't have to count against your lobbying limit because that is executive action that you are asking for as opposed to legislative action. Um, similarly, if you want to work with state agencies, for example, or federal agencies to try to impact their rulemaking and regulation processes, that's not going to count as lobbying as well. Those are still really impactful types of advocacy um, that a lot of nonprofits do, but the good news is you don't have to count it against your public charities lobbying limits. Um, now, again, you know, just always put a kind of pin in this, but those types of activities may trigger um, some state level, local level, federal level lobbyist registration and reporting requirements. Those are separate and apart from the tax code, separate and apart from the concerns of the IRS. We're really just focusing in on those IRS tax code rules for today. Um, but again, you know, these types of activities don't have to count against your lobbying limit because, again, they're not legislative in nature. They're involving some other branch um, of government. Now, that kind of gets us through direct lobbying. Again, direct lobbying is communication with a legislator that expresses a view about specific legislation. Grassroots lobbying, again, these are the definitions for groups that have made that 501H election. Grassroots lobbying, again, you can put up to 25% of your overall lobbying budget for the year towards grassroots lobbying. But you'll notice it's a little different than direct lobbying because the audience is different. And so as opposed to communicating to the legislator, you're now communicating to the general public. Still have to express a view about specific legislation for something to be considered grassroots lobbying. But you also have to have a call to action if you are operating under these 501H definitions as opposed to those default definitions. So if you communicate to the general public and express a view about specific legislation and do not include a call to action, and you've made that 501H election or are operating under those definitions, you do not have to count whatever that communication is against your lobbying limits. Um, and so just to kind of explain what a call to action is, um, a call to action can only have four different, uh, there's only four different types. These are actually spelled out in the tax code. Um, so asking the public to contact their legislator is a call to action. That's one type. Um, so for example, call your senator and express your outrage over SB 57. Making up a number, I have no idea what SB 57 is. Um, but that would be a call to action, right? Because you are asking the public who you're communicating to, to contact their legislators. Another type of call to action is providing contact information for a legislator. So if you put their phone number, their address, their Twitter handle, those are considered calls to action because you are kind of placing or encouraging that person to contact their legislators by providing that contact information. 
providing a mechanism to enable communication with legislators is a call to action. Um, so for example, the texting apps, where if I type in my zip code and I send it to a certain number, it's going to auto-generate that letter that they can get sent to. I happen to be in Texas, so it's getting sent to Senator Cruz, right? Um, but you know, you also see these on websites where there's like a form. And if I type in my name and my zip code, it's going to auto-send, auto-email that that note to my legislator. Um, that's a mechanism to communicate with legislators. That's considered a grassroots lobbying call to action as well. Um, and then identifying the recipient's legislators that are undecided about a piece of legislation. So if you name, for example, the members of a legislative committee who are about to vote on a piece of legislation, um, that's the type of thing that calls counts as an indirect call to action as well. Um, but what is not a call to action? Saying something like, learn more take action, support our efforts. That could mean make us a donation. It doesn't necessarily mean call your senator about this bill or call your representative. Um, and so just asking someone to do something doesn't count as a call to action. Um, what counts as a call to action are those four things that are on the left-hand side of this screen. And so you have to have one of those four things for something to be considered a grassroots lobbying communication under these 501H definitions. But yes, question. Thank you. This is awesome. This is so clear. <laughs> and, I, and I do love a very uh, organized uh, slide deck. So uh, <laughs> um, uh, we had a, a question in the chat. Do you have advice for finding info on local slash state lobbying and registration laws? I do. Um, so Boulder Advocacy Alliance for Justice, Boulder Advocacy, um, and once we get to the Q&A portion, I'll actually drop the link in the chat. But if you want to Google it in the meantime, we have a series called our Practical Guidance Series. And so if you just Google um, whatever state, we have all 50 states. So whatever state you're interested in. So, for example, New York, Boulder Advocacy, Practical Guidance Lobbying, it will take you to the New York specific rules. Um, so we have a guide for each of the 50 states that cover the state laws um, that might trigger lobbyist registration and reporting. It doesn't get into every major city. And honestly, a lot of cities have their own lobby lobbying ordinances, but a lot of them don't. Um, I'm in Texas and there are only a handful of really big cities that have lobbyist ordinances, but most of the smaller places just don't even have them. They don't exist. Um, but those state guides should help you at least with the state level uh, question. So again, practical guidance lobbying series, type out your state Boulder advocacy and you should find it, but I'll drop a link um, a little bit later in the chat um, for the for the full series so that you can see all 50 states. Um, oh, it looks like we've already got the, the link in the chat. So there you go. <laughs> um, but that should be helpful. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us too. Um, but I want to go through just a couple of examples because I think this really helps illustrate the distinctions between that insubstantial part test and the 501H test and the different definitions of lobbying. Um, so here we have an ad. We're going to pretend... This is put out by a 501c3 public charity. Maybe they put it, you know, they sent it out to their email newsletter. They posted it on their social media. This is on their Instagram account. And they also paid to run an ad in the local newspaper, right? Um, and it says no paid sick days for restaurant employees and enhanced dining experience for restaurant customers. Nearly half of all workers in Maine lack paid sick days. Support your fellow Maine workers and their right to recover from illness without endangering public health or losing a day's pay. Contact your legislator and share your support of LD1454, the paid sick days bill. The question on the table, and if you feel so bold, drop your answer in the chat, but absolutely do not feel obligated. But the question is, is this lobbying? And so if you are a 501c3 public charity, do you need to count this communication against your organization's lobbying limits? Or if you have a fiscal sponsor, do you need to report this communication to them so that they can count it against their lobbying limits? Um, and the answer is yes. And so I think both of those uh, answers in the chat are absolutely correct. Um, this is a classic example of grassroots lobbying, but it also counts as lobbying under that insubstantial part test because it advocates for the adoption of legislation. Um, and so this is a communication to the general public. It expresses a view about LD 1454, the paid sick days bill, and it has a call to action because it says contact your legislator and share your support of LD 1454. Um, so again, classic example of grassroots lobbying. If you're under that insubstantial part test, it doesn't matter what this costs, but it does count as lobbying. It needs to be tracked against your kind of three to 5% lobbying limits. Um, if you are under that 501H expenditure test, this more specifically needs to count against your grassroots lobbying limit because it is a grassroots lobbying communication. So any expenses associated with this, you know, the, the staff time spent designing it, the actual 
fee that you paid to the newspaper to run the full page ad, all of that needs to count against your lobbying limit um, under that 501H expenditure test, specifically against your grassroots lobbying limits. Um, now, here's another example, same campaign, still posted in their newsletter on their Instagram, and uh, they ran that ad in the paper, still a public charity. It says she'll be your server tonight, and she's pretty sure it's contagious. Uh, she's apparently got the same uh, sinus infection that, that Jay Lee has. <laughs> but it says nearly half of all workers in Maine lack paid sick days and are forced to work through their illnesses in order to pay the bills. Um, support LD 1454, the paid sick days bill. And the question on the table again is, is this lobby? Does it need to be tracked against your lobbying limits? Um, this one is a little bit more tricky, right? Um, and the answer could potentially be no. Um, and so we have to think about it from, you know, the two different test angles. So if you are under that default insubstantial part test, and otherwise your organization has not opted in to using those 501H limits and definitions, then this is lobbying because it is in support of LD 1454, the paid sick days bill. And under that insubstantial part test, anything that advocates for or against legislation, period, is lobbying that needs to be tracked against your limits. But if you've made that 501H election, the question then becomes, because this is a communication to the general public as opposed to legislators, is it lobbying? Um, and, you know, we've got the communication. It's to the general public. It does express a view about LD 1454, the paid sick days bill. It's clearly in favor of it. But what is it missing? It is missing that call to action because it doesn't have one of those four types of calls to action that we discussed previously. Um, and so if you are a 501H electing organization or you're reporting to a fiscal sponsor that has made the 501H election, this does not need to count as grassroots lobbying. Um, and so that's kind of another illustration of why so many groups decide to make the 501H election because you get to take advantage of those narrower definitions for lobbying. Now, I will mention that at the bottom of this ad, there's a there's a web address, right? Um, so in theory, you could maybe click it and it goes to a, a website. Um, if within one click of an initial communication, you get to a call to action, you want to go ahead and count the original communication as grassroots lobbying too. Um, so if we clicked on that and it went to a mechanism to communicate with legislators or it's the contact information for legislators, that type of thing, we would count this ad against our grassroots lobbying limit. But if we just click on that and we get more information about the bill, then we don't have to count it against our lobbying limits if we've made that 501H election, because again, it's still missing that grassroots lobbying call to action. Um, so a little bit tricky, um, but that's what the tax code kind of requires us to do. And again, that's one of the major advantages to making that 501H election is you can actually do more and not have to count it against your limits. Um, now, I will mention briefly, there are, um, for 501H electing organizations, there are some exceptions to the definition of lobbying that can also offer you more flexibility in terms of your advocacy. You're going to see those exceptions listed here. Um, the first one is called nonpartisan analysis, study, or research. Uh, but this is basically when you do a really robust research project, you compile all the data, you offer a full and fair discussion of all sides of the issue. You know, in other words, you're giving the reader enough information so that they can make an informed and independent conclusion about the subject matter. So it's not so one sided. Um, that you aren't giving them the big picture, right? Uh, but if you do that and you broadly disseminate it, you, you know, advertise it widely, you don't immediately turn around and use it for lobbying purposes, um, then even if you make some sort of legislative recommendation, as long as you don't have a grassroots lobbying call to action in there, you don't have to count it as lobbying. Um, now, there are a lot of T's to cross and I's to dots in order to take advantage of that exception. We have an, a, a fact sheet on it that goes into a little bit more depth. And so if you Google Boulder Advocacy Nonpartisan Analysis, you'll probably see that. Um, but, you know, that is an exception for 501H electors and allows them to do a lot of really great research that could potentially be used for legislative purposes down the road, but that wouldn't have to count as lobbying if you fall into that exception. Um, reason why that's important is because preparation for lobbying under both of these definitions for lobbying counts as lobbying. Um, so if you do anything specifically for the purpose of using it for your lobbying campaign, that's going to count against your lobbying limits too. So things like strategy sessions or you know compiling research and data for a one pager that you want to hand to legislators, all that prep time counts against your lobbying limits too. Um, but this gives kind of a window of, of an exception uh, if you happen to check the boxes for nonpartisan analysis. Um, request for technical assistance. This is a super narrow definition. 
um, of, you know, of an exception for lobbying. This is when you get a formal written invitation on a committee letterhead for you to come and testify before a legislative committee. Um, if you go and testify in response to that formal written invitation, even if you express a view on legislation to the legislators during that hearing, uh, you don't have to count it as lobbying. Um, this is when you've established your expertise in an area, the legislators really trust you, and so they want you to come to that committee hearing to give your testimony in front of that committee so that they can make an informed decision about the bills that are being considered. Uh, but again, you have to have a written invitation, so a phone call from a legislative buddy saying, hey, I think it's important that you be there. That's not going to qualify. But if you get a formal written invitation on the committee chair's letterhead, you know, it's signed by the committee chair that says, hey, come and testify. We want to hear about your expertise on this issue. Then you can express a view on legislation during that testimony, and you don't have to count it as lobbying, assuming you stick to the topic um, at hand and stick to the legislation you were invited to discuss. Um, Self-defense, another really narrow exception having to do with nonprofit organizations' existence, powers, duties, and tax-exempt status or the deductibility of contributions. Um, basically, you know, let's say that Congress was considering a bill that would make it so that donations to C3s were no longer going to be tax deductible. You could advocate for or against that and not have to count it as lobbying um, because it goes to the deductibility of contributions. Um, or maybe they wanted to pass a bill that would make it so that 501c3s can support or oppose candidates, which we know now that we are prohibited from supporting or opposing candidates for public office. Well, you know, if they made that a law that you could support or oppose candidates, that would greatly change the powers of nonprofit organizations, right? Um, and so you could chime in on that, not have to count it as lobbying, even if it met the definition otherwise. Um, so we're not talking about things that just impact your organizations, but things that impact the sector as a whole uh, effectively there. Um, that's an exception for the definition of lobbying. And then finally, examinations and discussions of broad social, economic, and similar problems. We're talking about things like blue ribbon panels, symposiums, events where you get a whole bunch of experts together to talk about issues, but you aren't really making legislative recommendations. Uh, so again, these are four exceptions that apply to anyone who has made that 501H election. Um, it is not totally clear whether they apply to groups that have not made the 501H election. So I'll just you know put a little flag in that just in case. Uh, but if you've made the 501H election or you are operating under a fiscal sponsor that has made the 501H election, these exceptions are really good uh, to make use of. But again, if you fall into one of these four categories, you don't have to count it against your lobbying limits as an organization. Um, so here's our pop quiz. We've only got a couple of pop quiz items here. Again, don't feel obligated, but if you feel like uh, testing yourself, go ahead and drop your response in the chat. But the question on the table is, is it lobbying? Um, what about posting this image and project description on your organization's website? Um, this is the Red Umbrella Campaign, Lifting the Stigma of Sex Work. Uh, it talks about UCLA's Global Lab for Research and Action in collaboration with a coalition of advocacy organizations has launched a data-driven national social awareness campaign to address the dangers and stigma that sex workers face. The Red Umbrella Campaign will share extensive research and amplify voices of individuals with lived experience. Um, they provide some quotes from the people who were responsible for this research. Um, and then, you know, basically talk a little bit more about the researchers and activists and the compilation of this information. Uh, but the question is, would this count as lobbying, this research um, and the publication of this research that needs to be tracked against a public charity's lobbying limits? I'll let you think about it for a second. And the answer is no. Um, this is speaking about a public education program. It's not making legislative recommendations specifically. Um, so this is, you know, kind of a research project, more about public education. Um, and so most likely, you know, I didn't get into the to the nitty gritty details of this particular report, but most likely this is not going to be a lobbying communication under either the insubstantial part test or that 501H test. Uh, but let's look at one more example here. What about sending this comments to your organization's newsletter subscribers? Um, and it says decriminalize, de decriminalizing sex work is a matter of health, safety, and survival. Um, we're talking specifically about D.C. area sex workers have reported that they sometimes engage in their work as a matter of survival. Um, and then it talks about other locations like New Zealand and Belgium have moved towards a decriminalization model uh, where research shows that people who engage in sex works are, um, you know, are, are more protected. And then it talks about how D.C. should pass the Community Safety and Health Amendment Act to decriminalize sex work and repeal current solicitation laws. Um, and the question is, is this lobbying? 
just looking at the chat. And the answer is, this is lobbying if you are working under the insubstantial part test because it does advocate for the passage of the Community Safety and Health Amendment Act, but it is not lobbying if you operate under the 501H expenditure test. Why? Because there is no call to action. Um, so some organizations may have to count this post um, in their organization's newsletter as lobbying, but other organizations that have made the 501H election or are operating under a 501H electing fiscal sponsor would not have to count this as lobbying against their lobbying limits. Um, and so another one where we're kind of splitting hairs a little bit, but that's what the tax code requires us to do. Um, and so just an example of how some things may be lobbying under one test, but may not be lobbying under the other. Um, now, just some takeaways and resources before we wrap here, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, but 501c3 public charities can advocate and lobby. Um, I will mention there's another type of 501c3 called a private foundation. Many of your funders might be private foundations. Um, they are different than public charities, so their rules are different. They're actually more restricted than public charities. Um, so when I say 501c3 here, I'm really talking about public charities as opposed to private foundations. Um, but 501c3 public charities can advocate and lobby. If you do lobby, you've got to track it and report it on your 990. So you're making sure you're staying within your lobbying limits. Um, most 501c3 public charities can maximize the amount of lobbying they're allowed to do by making that 501h expenditure test election. Um, but importantly, not all activities count as lobbying. And so you do need to be aware of which definitions you operate under in order to determine what needs to be tracked against your limits. Um, I mentioned that we have a ton of resources. <laughs> all of our resources are free for download on our website. Um, we also have a podcast that comes out every other Wednesday. I think our next episode comes out tomorrow. So if you want to um, subscribe to the Rules of the Game podcast and kind of nerd out with us every other Wednesday, uh, feel free to do so. Um, but we also have a comprehensive guide called Being a Player, a guide to IRS lobbying regulations for advocacy charities. That's our big guide about lobbying. Um, and then, of course, that practical guidance series I mentioned earlier, which talks about the state level requirements. Um, the other thing I just want to plug before we go to Q&A is that we do offer free technical assistance for any nonprofit, any shape, any size, anywhere in the country. So spread the word. Um, but if you scan that QR code, you'll go to our technical assistance forum. We have lawyers on staff five days a week to help answer your questions, try to respond within 24 to 48 hours. That is a totally free service. We cannot offer formal legal opinions. We can't offer legal advice, but happy to help you navigate these rules and kind of ask us the basics. Um, so feel free to use that as much as you'd like. We will not try to sell you anything. Um, but yeah, free technical assistance for any nonprofit. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back um, to Jay Lee and just see um, what the questions might be. But if we want to stop recording, I think that's the end of the slideshow.